Welcome to the Cheely Law Review. My name is Ben Burnett. My guest today is Bob Cheely. Bob, welcome. Hello, Ben. Ben, my friend. I want to talk to you today about what a case is worth. In, in the eyes of a plaintiff, in the eyes of a defendant, which you are not on that side, how do you determine value to a case? That's a great question, Ben. You know, every case obviously is different. I'll tell you, first of all, some of the factors that I look for in order to put a value on a case. Number one is my client. As soon as I get hired, I want to get to know my, my client and I want to formulate in my own mind, is this the kind of person that a jury is going to love and like and want to help? Assuming, I think all of my clients, for the most part, of I can check that box. Or if they don't check that box, I'm, I may not want to take the case. If they're arrogant or they're a crybaby, people don't, that's the last thing that jurors want to hear is somebody that just bemoans their situation all, all of the time. I don't want to represent people that are in those two categories for sure. You know, I, I handle cases for catastrophically injured people or, or serious injuries. And uh, I also handle cases for business people that get defrauded or breaches of fiduciary duties result in large damages. You know, in selecting a jury, I always ask them, does, do any of you ever, do you have a preconceived idea as to what's the maximum amount of damages that you would ever award? And so I don't really want them to tell me, you know, a number. I just want them to tell me that they'll keep an open mind. And of course, the law requires them not to have a fixed amount that under no circumstances would I award more than, than this amount of money. So I began preparing the case with the end in mind, which the end being, what do I ask the jury for at trial? And one of the things in, say, a, a big damages case is a lot of the defense and insurance claims adjusters look at cases and they want to know, you know, what's the total number of special damages? Like how much are the medical bills? How much are the lost wages? How much are the special expenses that had to be incurred in order to take care of the plaintiff after they were injured? Or in the business setting, what are the, the lost revenue opportunities in the company before my client got squeezed out of the company, say, by somebody who became their partner and, and had deeper pockets and could squeeze them out so that they could take the company away. We, uh, we began working early in the case to put those kind of damages together. And most claims adjusters in the, ca- in the context of personal injury and kind of cases involving significant damages, they want to take a, a multiplier of, say, two to three times the amount of medical bills or lost wages and, and multiply that and, in order to come up with a a settlement valuation range. I refuse to to allow myself to be governed by those kind of multipliers. And I tell my attorneys here that I train and and go to to trial with, the case is worth what we say it's worth, not what the way in which insurance adjusters put values on cases. Well, and I think that's fair. If you look at somebody who's acquiring a business holistically without any sort of legal hardship involved, it's a certain number of times Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So if you're acquiring a business without any sort of legal hardship, you look at the EBITDA number and industry will govern what the multiple is on that. Is it? Do you look at it the same way or is it kind of a separate thing? Earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciating assets. In the context of a personal injury, catastrophic injuries, for example, you can't use the EBITDA approach really, but you can use a a multiplier that's much larger than what the insurance industry wants you to use. The way I do that is I focus upon the loss of the quality of life. I mean, how has this injury impacted in a negative way a person's ability to enjoy life? You know, that, I and I don't even know, even on your best day, I'm not sure that can always be measured. You're exactly right. And so I don't get caught in the little hamster wheel that the insurance industry wants you to get on and run by coming up with some two to three time multiplier. I'd I focus on a different battlefield, which is loss of enjoyment of life. When you look at business cases, is it in the same, I know they're clearly not the same type of cases as as a personal injury or wrongful death or something like that. In a business case, it's clearly, I would imagine most of the time the individual is still somewhat healthy, although mentally distressed. But how do you determine and put value on that? Is it similar to that EBITDA conversation? Is it similar to what they were defrauded out of? Is it, this guy didn't want to sell the business at all? You know, he could have run this business for another 
45 years if he had wanted to. You do use standard valuation methodologies, and that does in the business setting, and that that includes multiples of EBITDA, and because that's the generally accepted way people buy and sell companies. Whenever you have one of those cases, your goal is to get the defendant who committed breaches of fiduciary duty to client to agree to the methodology that's used and to, for example, what are the, the margins on the products that the company made? And then what are the multipliers that are used for that type of industry for putting valuations on companies for sales purposes? As much agreement as you can, and it doesn't come easy, boy, I'll tell you, these uh, defendants, they, they will squirm and they'll bob and weave and try to evade uh, answering the questions, but you got to nail them down. It makes the jury's job a lot easier when there's consensus between the plaintiff and the defendant as to the methodology. Well, this has been another episode of the Chile Law Review. Thank you for joining me today, Bob. Good to be with you, Ben. Have a great week, everybody. 